last lesson in this series called uh, Be Not Deceived, Beware of False Teachers. Now, as I come to the end of this, it's interesting because the way I've laid this out is I've been laying, I've been presenting to you interpretation difficulties that are used by false teachers for the intent purpose of leading you astray. Uh, we are through uh, interpretation difficulty number four in the past five lessons, and then today, as you will notice, we're going to do number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 all in one lesson. And the reason for that is, is numbers uh, 6 through 12, I will present to you a short little message and stop at each point in the short little message and show you the interpretation difficulty, and you'll be able to catch on these real quick. These don't take a lot of, um, of understanding or a lot of research to know. They're just warning signs. Now... I'm going to say this to you now, and I'm going to say to it to you later. We who are teachers and communicators, preachers, Bible study leaders, scholars, uh, seminary professors, and whatever, we have all been guilty of doing these interpretation difficulties 1 through 12. We're all guilty of them, just simply because of the way we speak and the way we talk. For instance, you've often heard a preacher say, now the Bible says this, or the Bible says that. Well, that's one of the interpretation difficulties. Uh, it's right there, by the way. It's, it's number eight. It's si saying without citing. In other words, I tell you what the Bible says, but I don't tell you where to go find it. Therefore, you can't go look at it to know and to test me whether I am teaching you the truth or not. Am I using that passage or that what I just said the Bible says... Uh, for instance, here's a good one, and I will use it later on. God says, uh, God helps those, or the Bible says, God helps those who help themselves. Well, how many times have you heard someone say that? That the Bible teaches God helps those who help themselves. But we don't ever tell you what chapter, what book, what verse it is. And there's a reason for that. It's not there. It's right. It's not there. So you hear many of these, and so your ear, what, what I'm trying to present to you are these interpretation difficulties is that when you hear one of these coming up, your ear kind of perks and you go, no, no, wait, wait a minute, okay, is it there or is it not there? Now listen, we all make this mistake as communicators. Uh, sometimes I will say to you, in Corinthians it says this, well, I'm fixing to tell you something that's in Corinthians. But I can't remember if it's 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. You follow me? Or, or the letter to Timothy says this. Well, I can't, for some reason, my brain's not working. I can't remember if it's 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy. But I'm telling you, if you go read Timothy, you're going to find what I'm going to say to you. And I'll probably even quote the verse to you. Why? Because, and I'll quote it in King James, by the way, because when I was in vacation Bible school growing up, we would line up in front of the church and we had a verse every day we had to memorize, and we had to quote it before we went in. And when we quoted it, we got a popsicle or something like that that we could stick in our pocket for after vacation. Some of y'all did vacation Bible school too, you know what I'm talking about. And those verses have stayed with me all my life. And I just promise you, even though I read for enjoyment out of the New International Version, I teach out of the New American Standard Version, if I quote a scripture to you, it is probably going to be King James. Just bottom line, it's probably going to be King James. Nothing wrong with King James as long as you know how to handle King James. Nothing wrong with New American Standard as long as you know how to handle New American Standard. Nothing wrong with NIV, New International, as long as you know how to handle it. I'm going to kind of hit that today too. But the fifth interpretation difficulty that we must address in a little longer phase than I'm going to hit numbers uh, 6 through 12 is called added text. Added text uh, is, when we, uh, is when we find something that is not there in the original. Now, as we've gone throughout these lessons, these first five lessons, we've talked about... Uh, uh, if, if the text makes plain sense, common sense, don't seek any uh, deeper sense. 
Don't seek something mystical. You don't need a translator or anything. Don't, don't seek that because the Bible was written in plain common sense. When those Israelites came out of the wilderness with the first five, chap, first five books of the Bible, they understood every word plainly because it was in their language. They knew what it meant. They didn't need an interpreter. Uh, when the New Testament was written, the, the Gospels and all that type of stuff, uh, it's finished the New Testament. Even the book of Revelation was understood in plain common sense because it was written in the language of the people. Didn't need to be translated. They understood it. That's the first thing. Then we've got figures of speech that figures of speech that come up, sayings. We all use figures of speech in English. But the Bible, the Greek, the Hebrew, the uh, Chaldean, and the Aramaic had figures of speech too, which are difficult to switch over into our language. And so we struggle with these. And so we have to understand that the figures of speech, uh, we're understanding them correctly. And then we get to definitions of words. And if you remember, we spent three lessons talking about definitions of words. All the way from word studies and all of that. And when we got down to the bottom line, the bottom line was, when we look and we say, this English word means this Greek word. This, this Greek word means this in English. We have to go say, okay, when they put that word in English, what did it mean in English? You follow me? What does the word today that would be a better word than that word? And I spent three lessons just getting down to that point because that's the, the thing that all of us have to understand. And I told you, if you remember, um, uh, and, and, and gave you the... Um, the understanding that you don't have to understand Greek and Hebrew to find these little hiccups. All you have to do is lay out in front of you six or seven different versions. Get you a King James. Get you a New American Standard. Get you an NIV. Get you a Holman. You can use an Amplified if you want to. Get you an ESV. Get six or seven translations and read what you're reading in all of them and if the verse comes up across all the versions and it basically says the same thing, that verse is good to go. That verse is good. There's no problem with that verse at all. The translators had no problem putting that into common language because all the words and the definitions we use today, our definitions match across the board. No matter what words they used, we know it's all saying the same thing. But... If you come along, like we saw in John 3.16, we saw, um, uh, we, could have, we could have seen it in John 3.17 if we had torn that one apart. Uh, over in the Colossians passage, the firstborn passage and all of that, Colossians 1.15. If we look across seven versions and we've got problems and say, well, wait a minute, this version and this version, this version means this, and these two versions mean that, which kind of don't match, and this version is way out here in left field, then you need to understand that you as an English reader, you've hit a verse that needs some real study to figure out what are they all meaning. And the reality is when the words were put into those translations by those committees, they were the right words for that time. But our English language changes so fast that we put new definitions on words and we forget about the old archaic definitions that are many times still in the dictionaries, but we don't go look them up because they're way down the list on, on the old definitions of words. And so we've done that. Now we come down to a thing that's just purely mechanical, and we have to look at it. It's called added text. Uh, by the way, one more thing I want to say to you is, and it's on your list there on, on your front, uh, subtopics. Now, you think we just did, if you think we just did a plain common sense figures of speech and definitions of words, the reality is I snuck some other stuff in in those first five lessons. We have studied all of these topics that are rolling out and that are on. These are all very important little topics that I could have spent a week on them, an hour on them, and that would have gone on forever. It had been Christmas before we'd gotten into anything else. And I would have had to add some more to them as we went even through this lesson, uh, especially when we've added, you know, eight here. I could have spent a week on each one of these also. And I don't want to do that. I'm just giving you clues to help you. If some preacher, some teacher, something says something, your, your ears pop up when certain things happen because 
here at Sagemont Church, whether it's Chuck Snyder, John Morgan, Emery Gadd, Charles Seville, Chuck Cummings, myself, I just go down the list, James Bouvier, whatever. When you hear us teaching, we may make these interpretation difficulties uh, mistakes. We may make them. But when you go research what we've said, you're going to find out that we all hold the same theology, and it's the theology of the Bible. I cannot say that any longer about all Southern Baptist churches, because more than half of the Southern Baptist churches have become what we call emerging churches. And so they have put new theology definitions out there that don't match what we believe here at Sagemont Church. In fact, the um, emerging churches are going to destroy Southern Baptist congregations simply because the basic theology is not there to maintain uh, what the Southern Baptist churches are all about in all different areas, from theology to our mission supports and everything else that happen out there. We, we are the largest, Southern Baptists are the largest mission organization in the world. We have more full-time missionaries throughout the world in places where we cannot even tell you where the missionaries are because they are in places almost like CIA agents but they're in there for the Lord. And so th things like we have heard, like the a family that we represent and we support here out of this class, I'm not going to mention their name, but we support them where we have to code certain words in our emails so that the government that's looking at everything does not pick up and know that they're missionaries uh, in, in their their they may have a printing business company. They may have a funeral company. They may have some sort of company that they are doing business as, but the purpose is they are there as missionaries, paid to be there as missionaries. Well, uh, with all of those, uh, the Southern Baptist denomination, the a group of Southern Baptists that we are, to all bind together, we have the greatest mission force on the world and have for more than a hundred and something years. But that's going to come to an end because the uh, churches, uh, Southern Baptist churches that are we call emerging uh, doctrine, the emerging church doctrine, do not believe in supporting missionaries in that way, and so that's hurting us. Uh, 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 because they do not know the heritage of, of the good that is done. But anyway, with that. So we have all these topics that are there that we have, we have uh, discussed. All of them should be something that you know a little bit about. So let's go on to the added text. Added text is when some passage has been added to our text for some reason somewhere along the road, and it may or may not belong there. In fact, in all cases, really, it really doesn't belong there. So throughout our English translations, in our versions, and um, words have been added, words by themselves have been added. Let's don't talk about phrases. Let's talk about maybe one or two words at a time have been added for the purpose of helping you understand what the original language would, languages was trying to say. Well, with doing that, the reality is our committees that have put our King James Version together, our New, Eng New King James Version together, New American Standard, whatever version it is, they have in reality interpreted and presented upon on you or placing upon you their theology of what that passage means. So by adding words that really don't fit, they are doing an interpretation to, to bend that verse to wherever they believe it should go in a theolo theological position. So to do that, we have to ask the question. So if they're doing that, how do we find out how added words and phrases are to be handled when we see them in our Bible? Now, the, the answer to that is, how many of y'all have ever heard of a preface? A preface. Good. Well, here, let me tell you this. The first thing that you should see and read when you get a Bible is a preface. Even the King James 1611 version of the Bible has a preface. You read that preface and you learn about the 32 committees that offered full 
Genesis to Revelation uh, versions of the Bible to King James and how he selected one of them with particulars about names and all that type of stuff. You also learn of how they handled certain words. Uh, King James did not use the word Jehovah. Uh, instead of using the word Jehovah, they made the decision to use the word Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Every time you see the word spelled that way, it means Jehovah in the original language. Then they've got it to where it's capital L with all the rest of the letters are small letters like normal. That means a master or someone who has, who has authority over you. And then you've got the little Lord, which is just a little L uh, over there. And that means your direct representative. It could be your father or someone like that, that whenever he asks you to do something, uh, the reply, the proper reply from the biblical days was, I will do that, my Lord, or I would do that, my father. But they would say, they'd use the little word, Lord. The King James preface from 1611 tells us that's how they use those words. How they were used the word uh, Christ, how they were used the word Jesus, how the word they use word Messiah, etc., etc. It tells us all those things. So, the preface is the first thing when you get a new Bible you should read. Why? Because it doesn't just tell you about um, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about God's Word. It tells you how the committee laid out God's Word for you with all its little signs and clues. With its italic words, with its brackets, with its uh, uh, footnotes, with its parentheses or whatever. The, pre the preface tells you how to handle that copy, that version. And... Do not think that because you have read the preface to the King James Version, you know how to read an NIV or an NASB, New American Standard, because the committees all used it different. Now, I will tell you something that's interesting. The preface is, is mighty and powerful, even though it's not uh, godly. It's from the committee. Uh, there used to be a man at this church uh, who was here for a long, long time, and at different... Uh, Let's see, has anybody ever been around here 30 years? How many, how many of y'all been here 30 years? Uh, 27 years almost? Oh, my soul. Am I 27? Good. All right, because I've been here since October of 1990. When did y'all come? 89. So, so you're my seniors, okay, <laughs> here, because we came the next year. In fact, I went to the finance committee meeting the other night, and I said, I want to know when all of y'all joined the church. Well, I've got them all by like 10 years, so I'm senior to all of them. It's kind of interesting when you're staff. Now, think about that, because Preacher's been here 52 years. Chuck, Bill Cole's been here 30. Chuck's been here, what, 33. I've been here 27. Emory Gad's been here and on and off for 40 years. I mean, your staff has, has a longer tenure here than most of the people who are here. That's, you don't see that in churches. You just don't see that in church. Okay. Let me get to my point. Anyway, from 30 years ago, in fact, he was still here. Uh, this man was still here because he joined my 930 class when I started it many years ago. But he used to get up in the middle at the end of a, a business meeting and he'd say, Pastor John. He had one of those voices that just kind of shook, Ooh, kind of made it sound like God. Ooh. He said, and he'd start quoting out of the King James, by, you know, King James verses by memory. God did, did blah, 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 blah. okay, and, and Brother John, well, thank you, thank you, sir, and I'm not going to tell his name because family are still here, and so uh, he comes and he joins, and he is beside himself. He's writing me handwritten notes uh, telling me how uh, the New American says this, but the King James says this. We should hold to the King James. After all, it was good enough for Paul, and it's <laughs> good enough for us and I <laughs> I've I've been in a church like that I mean I grew up in churches where King James was good enough for Paul it was good enough for us okay and we didn't know any better in fact I'll tell you like right now if you go down the road and you see a sign on a church that says gospel light Baptist church they are a King James only version church and if you bring in a new American standard I don't think they'll check you at the door but if you quote from it you're going straight to 
as far as they are concerned, because they still believe it. So he, I finally wrote him a note back, and I said, would you please do me a favor? Would you read the preface of your King James Version? One week later, I received a note from him that says, please tell me an accurate translation to start using. That's all it took. That is all it took. Because the preface of his Bible, that, which was falling apart, by the way, because he had used it since probably 40 years, he, was, he had used it, the preface blew away all the conceptions he had about the King James Version. There's nothing wrong with the King James Version, except you have to have a PhD or two to understand all its wording. Now we've got the New King James, which is much easier. And I love the New King James. I love it. I really do. And so I have it on my desk. It's always there. But I use, I want to study out of something that's not a poetical version. King James and New King James has that rhythm to it. So they manipulate the words so it has a rhyme. I want something that's more straight to the point. I tend to be that way. So here we go. So one of the things we have to think about is we have to think about the purpose. Now since the purpose of this lesson and for the purpose of this lesson, I'm using the New American Standard. So just understand that. So when we, I want to know how the New American Standard uses certain added words inside of it. Now, at the end of the 8 o'clock class, a lady came up to me with a uh, NIV. And, no, not was NIV. It was a, um, some version. And she came up and she said, okay, this big passage that you showed me that was in brackets in, it's the last part of Mark. We're going to look at that later on. It's in brackets in the New American Standard. Mine's just in italics. And I said to her, if you'll look in the preface of your book, it'll tell you that when it's in italics, it's not in the oldest and most reliable copies of manuscripts that we have. Oldest and most reliable. You can pretty well draw a line in the sand at the 4th century. Just after the 400 BCs, the 300s are gone, 4th century is gone. About coming up on the 400, which is the 5th century, that's where you draw the line. We have bukus of copies of, of uh, just one piece of page or, or a whole book or whatever. We have uh, 31 full copies of the New Testament, by the way. Uh, from 125, 125, think about that, 125. Okay, 25 years plus four years, 29 years after John finished the Revelation, we have a full copy of the book of Revelation that's been copied, and, and we've got other copies after that that all match up to the 400s, okay? All these Bibles and all these manuscripts, of which we have about 5,600, the ones that we have that are from 400 backwards don't contain these editions that I'm going to show you today. They do not have them in it. All these editions happened after 400 and later. Some of them don't even occur until the 10th century and things like that. 900s AD. So I'm going to tell you how all that happened in just a little bit. So we're using the New American Standard. So for other versions, you need to see the preface there, but we're using New American Standard. So when you're coming along in a New American Standard and you see a word in italics, you got that? A word or maybe words in italics. And we're using this verse. It actually has three words that are in italics. It is Matthew chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 6. Now, I left out the verses in between. Uh, verse 5, I believe I left out. Because I'm looking for the wording that matches, okay? And this is in a passage where we're coming out. It's part of the Beatitudes. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and the Lord is saying two things twice, exactly the same. And so, but we've got added words that the editors added for us to help us in our English. It goes like this. Verse chapter 6 of Matthew verse 3 says, But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, did you catch that? What is done in secret. So is it, is it 
what you did in secret? Or is it what the Father who is in secret saw you do? You see that? We've got a problem here. Their three little words just caused a problem. Verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 6, same thing being said. But when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Same thing happened here. However, in this verse, it tells us that the Father is in secret. And then that comes along and says, and your Father who sees in secret or who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So when the committee felt that the extra English words were needed to help clarify the intent of the original meaning of this passage, the additions were printed in italics to indicate to the reader that these are added words, that you will never be able to find them in Scripture. Clue here, if some preacher is making a big deal about a word that's in italics in the New American Standard, he'll probably be in italics in some of the other verses too. If he's making a big deal out of an italicized word, he's making a big deal about nothing that matters. Because the word does not exist in the original language. It's one of our words that we added to help define what something meant. So, can't be found in any form or fashion. So, this, this, these added words always represent the committee's theological position. Uh, with the ESV, with the New Holman, which are very heavy, the committees are all what I call neo-Calvinistic. In these new, newest versions, they have added words in italics that really make it look like you're either born saved or you're born lost. And you have no choice in your destination of eternity. God makes that choice. So they've added some words to the text to make that happen. And they're in italics. They are. But most people who are sitting in the pew... Read the words as if they belong. You follow me? So please, if it's in italics, mark it out and read and see what the passage says. So these two verses from this Matthew passage causes, shows us two little kind of camps of problems here. In camp one, camp one would say, and would use the word what is done, uh, would say, your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In other words, camp one would say, the father saw what you did in secret and uh, because you did it in secret, he's going to reward you. Camp two, which is my camp, would strike out the words what is done and say, the father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see the difference? So both are in secret and you're going to be rewarded because the father who is in secret saw what you did in secret and reward you. And I know that's a hair's breadth of a difference, but it's major. It is major in many ways because we need to understand the father looks at everything we do secretly also because he is in secret. We don't know much about what the Father does. We know a lot about what the Holy Spirit does. We know a whole bunch about what Jesus does. We know less about what the Father does. When you list out the job descriptions of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Father's list of job duties is much smaller than the other two. Because He's the Father, He's the creator of the plan, but He's not the, he's not the one who created it. The God the Son created everything that was planned by the Father. Okay, so we go. So here we have it. So I'm in camp two. Why? Because the italicized words force the reader the, to, to see the interpretation of the committee. And it is most often best to skip those italicized words. Wherever you see them, skip them. Skip them. Okay, next. We come to phrases, words, and verses that are in parentheses. Parentheses. All right. We're going over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. And here we go. It says, But to each one of us 
grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Who is the gift from? Christ. There are some out there who falsely teach that the gifts that are going to be mentioned here were given by the Holy Spirit. They're not given by the Holy Spirit. These are gifts from Christ. He says, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, that means when he left his, let his feet come off of the Mount of Olives, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Actually, those that he took with him were all the saints of old who were walking around the streets. Go check chapter 27 of the book of Matthew and see if when Jesus was resurrected, if all the saints of old were not resurrected at the same time. When he came out of the grave, they came out of paradise. Abraham, Isaac, Adam, Eve, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, Jeremiah were walking around in the streets of Jerusalem and they were all recognized. Got that? 27th chapter of the book of Matthew, about verse 49, 50, 51, somewhere along in there. See, I'm not guilty of telling you something without citing. I did not make that mistake this go around, but I haven't made it in the past. We all use these mistakes, but at least our intent is right. Do not follow someone who is using these interpretation difficulties for the purpose of, of intentionally leading you astray. By the way, those who are false teachers use these regularly to keep you in the flock, to keep you in the fold. The Jim Joneses, the Charles Simpsons, I could just keep going down the line. The Mary Baker, Eddie Patterson, Nelson, whatever the rest of her names were, that she, all the men she married in Christian science, they use these tactics, these interpretation difficulties, to keep you in line with their thoughts, not in line with the gospel thoughts. Okay, reading on. It says, now, this expression, now this is in the parentheses, he ascended, what does it mean that he uh, also, uh, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Is that what it means, he ascended? That means he had to also descend? Huh. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fulfill all things. And then it picks up, he says, and he gave some as pro apostles. Don't, don't turn the page yet. He gave his some as apostles and some as prophets. And he goes on to say uh, pastors and teachers and evangelists. Okay. So when we look at this, here's where we are. This, these two verses that are in parentheses, if we look back at the preface of the New American Standard, it tells us that this is a thought or a direct quote. It could be a direct quote or it could be a thought that comes from someplace else in the Bible. Now, it just so happens that we know where this place comes from. We know this comes over from uh, the writings of Peter. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Uh, but it's not an exact copy of what's over there it's someone some preacher along the way it's his interpretation of what Peter said that he comes over and he inserts into the Ephesians passage well how did it get copied into all these copies of the Bible after the 400s I'll explain that in just a minute so when we consider this what this committee's done this committee is telling us that those two verses, verses 9 and 10, are not in the oldest and most reliable uh, copies of the manuscripts about um, Ephesians that we have. So you say, now how did this happen? Well, the original manuscripts, such as the ones written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all the others, where they were inscribed on material that would not last the test of time. <clears throat> be it on vellum, be it on parchment or whatever, <clears throat> it would eventually degrade. But these scriptures were held to be so sacred. Can you imagine holding the writing of one of the letters of Paul directly out of his hand? Now listen, if all of you knew Paul because he'd already been in your city and he set your church up, it wouldn't be any different than the letter that you just received from me or John Mark or Emory Gad or what today. Oh, it's a nice card, wonderful card. Thank you. You don't think anything about it too much. You know it's God's word because 
They talk to God. They, it's just going. But as we go down, we as human in our human nature begin to get real sensitive about these things. In fact, we get real superstitious about them. Ooh. And so, <clears throat> but through time, uh, these very special documents, when they became, became tattered and torn from use, literally from use, they would be copied. And when they would be copied, <clears throat> the original would ceremonially be burned. That same uh, method of doing that, I know I learned it as a Boy Scout. What do you do with a torn and tattered flag? You burn it. You burn it. You don't bury it in the dirt. You, in fact, whenever I was growing up, you never let a flag hit the ground at all. We had respect for it, and it was burned ceremonially, okay, if it, if it was torn and dirty. That came down from how they used to handle ancient documents. That's not something new just for us. That was done in almost all the cultures. Anything sacred that was worn and everything, tattered and torn, was disposed of that way. So here is where the problem occurs. The people who own copies of manuscripts, and by the way, not everybody in those first three centuries had an entire Bible put together. It was this book, that book, this book, and that book, and the books were sent around to different churches for the pastor to use. Colossians comes to a church, he teaches out of Colossians. Philemon comes to a church. He teaches out of Philemon while these books are being circulated and they're traveling and they're, they're owned by somebody. And when the owner finally gets it back and it's worn, it may need to be copied and then ceremonially burned. But the problem is you now have preaching notes that have been written into them. Open your Bible. You have notes written in your Bible. And so that's where the problem comes in. They will have a new copy made, and the copier, the scribe, will continue to fill in and copy everything that's on the page. It's no different than taking something that you've written on today and putting it on top of a copier and making a new copy. Whatever is on the page is on the new page. You follow me? All right. Well, it wasn't until close to the 400s A.D. that anyone would ever write on a document that was sacred. You see? They just didn't do that. But as individuals began to copies being made and more made, people owned them. And a pastor could have every book of the Bible that he had at his, available to him. And remember, these are handwritten. Now, if you were to take our Word of God and handwrite it, it would be about this thick, about this big, by this big. Got it? In fact, it may be more thicker like this. So when they would go to the pulpit, they would go, and it was done on leaves, and they were tied together with string and all that. They would go with their copy for whatever book they were dealing with. And many times they would undo the copy and take just a few pages in. We do stuff like that all the time. Human nature hasn't changed. So one person would have a full copy, and when it was, when it was, when it was um, uh, dirty or whatever, he would hire a scribe who did that to simply make a Xerox copy of it with his hand. Not with the Minolta or the Xerox machine or whatever. He would copy it by hand and copy all the preacher's notes. Preacher doesn't want to have to rewrite his notes next time. More and more of these copies began to be made and people would purchase them. And by the 400s, we start seeing little notes come into it. And here we saw this one come into it. All right. Now, how many copies of the New Testament have survived? We have more than 5,600 handwritten copies of the New Testament. And with all those handwritten copies, there are only 71 places where additions have been made. And that includes, that includes the original edition of little words that don't belong. I'm not talking about italicized words that our committees added, 
but often, for instance, in uh, Romans uh, eight twenty eight, um, some of the pastors would write a the word there t h e i r into a certain place in there, and that word would end up getting copied in, and it changed the total meaning of uh, Romans eight twenty eight. But it was his theology about it, and he added the word for clarity. That word ended up staying in there, and we ended up getting it copied into our text until our committees came along using the oldest text and going, hey, it doesn't belong there. They took it out. And now our Calvinist friends have put it back in. You see what I'm saying? So you can't keep up with all that, but here's the deal. So when we look and I say the omission of words, what I'm saying is, those first copies in the first uh, three centuries did not have these 71 problems. They didn't have them. They don't start showing up till the 4th century. And then some of them don't even show up until the 9th century and the 10th century where they start showing up. So, how are omissions a problem? They are a problem because even though they're scattered throughout these 5,600 copies, regardless of when they were written or whatever, at a certain point, these, these additions that we call omissions, and yet they're really not omissions, they're additions, okay? They're not in the original oldest documents we have, not the originals, but the oldest we have, so they were never there. And But after the 4th century, they're there because they've been added. And they're added in different little stages. And what the miracle of this is, not one of those oldest documents has any of those 71 uh, 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 mistakes in them or additions in them. Not one of them. And then we have pockets and segments of manuscripts that we know how old they are. And they seem to start collaborating each other. And they start adding. And then finally we get closer to the 12th century. They all have it in. And then 12th century, we've got um, Wycliffe coming along to do his first translation into English from Latin. Uh, where the Latin came along also and started making these copies and all that. And then we have Tyndall coming in 1525, and he's copying the same mistakes into it. That's just where we are. That's just how it happens. Okay. Now, I remind you, when we're talking about originals, I mean, talking about what language it was in, we're talking about Greek, and we're talking about Hebrew. We're talking about these additions were in the Greek and Hebrew, not in the English. They were in the Greek and Hebrew. That's when we started translated into English. We just we just translated what was there. It was there, so we translated. Okay. So, as we look on here, we have to ask the question: How about the honesty of the committees? Before 1970, the committees knew about these additions, but they were not honest in our Bibles. Did you catch that? They did not. Because of cost of printing and typesetting, it was very difficult to switch from a type to put italics in a Bible or whatever before 1970. With 1970 coming along, printing changed, became more economical. And so what happened is, is on all the versions that have come out since 1970, they have been honest. Those committees have said, this is not in the original and oldest and most reliable documents. Therefore, we're going to mark it so. And they mark it in some way by a footnote, by italicized, by brackets, by parentheses. And here's a perfect example. In Matthew chapter 17, verse uh, 20, start with verse 20, it says, talk about Jesus. He says, and he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, this is out of the New American Standard, by the way, out of the New American Standard. This is how a New American Standard handles, handles this. And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Okay, so we've got a passage here that I've put in red. It actually should all be in red because it's the words of Jesus, okay? Uh, except for verse 22. 
but the previous to that was should have been on red. But I took everything, put it in black because I wanted to highlight what's in brackets. Now this is not parentheses, this is brackets. Brackets mean something else and it still should be omitted because it's not in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts. How does the NIV handle it? Here's how the NIV handles it. Watch. And he replied, because you have, have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Basically, that's the same thing the other one says. Okay. Now, what does it say next? When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of the men. That's exactly the same thing. But what did they do with the verse? Do you notice the verse is missing? The NIV made the decision on things like this. They would make a footnote and they put the verse down at the bottom of the page. The New American Standard made the decision. We'll leave it up in the text and put a footnote at the bottom that says, not in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts. By the way, the NIV, this is the same thing. It says, not in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts. And then it lists what's going to say what it was down there. And it'll write it down at the bottom. That verse is not there. Do you know how many people preach the theology of fasting based on that verse? How did it get in there? It got in there because there is a passage over in Mark chapter 9 verse 6 verse 9 or 9 verse 6. One of those two, okay? It's 6 is a 9, just flip them, okay? It's one way or the other. Over there in this same story, Jesus says, this kind does not go out except by prayer. It doesn't say the word fasting. It just says by prayer. It's over in Mark. Go find it. Test me on this. Here's the deal. Some well-meaning minister in his notes trying to prove up his topical message point went over and grabbed the thought and the exact wording from Mark and wrote it in Greek in his Greek manuscript because he's speaking Greek and he wrote it in to, to say this is proved over here in Mark, but he added the word and fasting to it. And the word and fasting is not there. In fact, that is not even there in those oldest manuscripts. Now, you can get all of that, but the word fasting over in Mark, but you can't get it here. You see what I'm saying? Everybody follow me? So when the copy of the torn and tattered manuscript the in handwritten in Greek that the preacher's preaching out of gets copied for him, it gets copied in the scripture, and eventually when he dies, that manuscript gets passed on to somebody else who has to have it copied, and somebody else wants a copy, so they hire a scribe to copy it, and that's how we end up with these copies of the copies of the copies of the copies, and with the additions to it. And we know that. That is not a hidden secret. It is not something mystical or whatever. And, you know, now we have the problem of... Um, uh, uh, Muslims and all that will come along and say, hey, you know, uh, your Bible is not correct because it's got these added texts in it. Well, we understand that. Uh, and then we've got these folks who come along and say, hey, your Bible's not correct, all correct, because there's still more God's Word out there. So you need to pick up the Book of Mormon and pick up the Hadith and pick up all of this too, because you don't have all the text. So we get hit from both sides. Both sides. You got mistakes. But you've got to have another book. We get hit from both sides. Okay, so let's look here. Here's the theology problem that is in these added texts. And I've already told it to you, really. We go over to this passage where this now, this expression, he descended, was taken from this place thought in 1 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 18, and following that says this, For Christ also died for the sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he al also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in the prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So what our Peter is telling us, during the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, there were people there who were so ungodly that they were sent someplace that Jesus went to proclaim to them about what was going on that had already been proclaimed to them during the time of the building of the ark, that judgment was coming. 
Now we pick that up, and what happens is, is some well-meaning person comes along and writes that thought over into the Ephesians passage, and along comes us English-speaking people. This is over here on the other side. On the side, I'm going to tell you what is there. They say, see, Jesus died on the cross, and he went to hell and suffered in hell three days and three nights for you, just so that you wouldn't have to. No. That is not what that passage means, but that's what's been read into that passage, and that's the theology that's been read in that passage. And I have heard that all my life. I like to die when I realized the theology that I had grown up with because I thought Jesus went to hell for me. No, he went to Hades. It blew my gasket when I found out the word hell is not in the Bible. You cannot find an English word for hell in the Bible. I mean, a Greek word for hell in the Bible or a Hebrew. Now, you can find the word Hades, but we got a problem with the word Hades and Sheo. Why? Because according to Luke chapter 16, we have Hades, which is the place of those who are departed. And that place, according to Jesus, has two compartments. One called the bosom of Abraham or paradise or the place of peaceful rest. That's where Samuel went, by the way, in the Old Testament. That's where every child of God who loved God, who walked in the ways of God, went to paradise or to the place of Abraham's bosom or the place of peaceful rest. And for all those who were ungodly and hated God, they went, according to this passage, they went to the compartment called torment. And in between the two, there's a gulf that they cannot cross across. Jesus went to paradise because he led captivity, those who were captive in paradise, out when he was resurrected. And they've gone to heaven to be with him. Just as the promise was to Daniel in chapter 12 of Daniel. Daniel says, oh Lord, but what about me? And the Lord says to Daniel, Daniel, don't you worry about you because you will be resurrected at the end of this era. In other words, at the end of being under the law, you will be resurrected. Matthew chapter 27, verse 49, 50, 51, 52, 27, 49, 50, 51, 52. You go read in that passage, right in there you'll see that when Jesus was resurrected out of the graves, all the graves were opened, the saints of old and came out and walked around the cities and they were seen. I believe if I was Festus or Felix or even Herod or anybody else, who saw Abraham and Isaac and Moses and Jeremiah and Obadiah and Malachi and, and just name them all, Nebuchadnezzar among the group too. I believe I would have become a believer right then. Boom. Right then. No, but that didn't fit the Jewish theology, so they had to hide it and work on it. So finally we come here. We come here to these brackets. What is the brackets for? Well, Within these copies of these that include all this stuff, the, the italics means that we have added words to help us understand. The parentheses means that we have added words or someone, someone added words back in the Greek or in the Hebrew from someplace else to bring it over. The thought is in the Bible. It's in the Bible, but it's not there in the oldest manuscripts. And then we got these brackets. And brackets mean... This thought, this passage, these words, what, these are nowhere in the Bible. Absolutely nowhere in the Bible. First example says, John chapter 7, verse 50. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them. <clears throat> see, that's in parentheses. We know exactly where that came from. Came out of John chapter 3. John 3.16 passage, Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus is coming in the middle of the night. That's where that thought is being brought from. Okay, we got that one. Okay, so it's in the Bible, but it didn't belong here. Said to them, our law does not judge a man unless he uh, it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, you are not also from Galilee, are you? And Jesus, a uh, search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And then here picks up this bracket. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Okay. Now in this passage, this John 53 through 811, we see 
the most beloved story of all time. This is probably the favorite story in every passage when it is portrayed. The problem is, is it's not found in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts anywhere. In fact, it's not even going to be found until many centuries after the Bible was already codified and put together as the number of books we have in it. So let's find out what that story is. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Uh, early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees, you notice I emphasized the word scribes, there's a reason for that, brought a woman caught in adultery, and having her set in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery. In the very act. Now, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such woman. What then do you say? Now, they were saying this, testing him, so that they might find grounds to accuse him. But Jesus stopped, stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman uh, where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from go. From now on, sin no more. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness. They are by themselves. Who is he talking to? Did you catch it? They all left. And the scripture, that passage there says they're by themselves. But we got some other problems. We got internal problems. Internal problems. The internal problem is this. The evidence here, when we see this, we don't see some of the, we don't see any of what I'm fixing to present to you in any of the other writings of John. He wrote the Revelation, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the full gospel of John. Everything that came before this, everything that comes after this, we have a problem. First, you see the word scribe, caught, persisted, straightened up? The Greek words that are in that passage are nowhere in any of John's other writings. He does not use those words. Did he just pop up and decide to use those words all of a sudden in one small section here? Why does it, Those are good words. Why doesn't he use them anyplace else? He does not use them ever. Do you got it? They are not Greek words he used, not in any of his writing. Second, the story seems to fit in the character and the flow uh, as it moves perfectly. Yeah, kind of like the story just dealing with Nicodemus. It, it, seems to carry on but it really doesn't because all of a sudden the they're out of there to the mount of olives and then the next day and then when we get through the story he begins teaching nobody's there now if you take that story out chop it out and go from the question they're asking him with all the people around and go to then he begins, begins to teaching that he's the light of the world it fits perfect by the way it fits perfect over in the other gospels true also so looking on, external evidence. First, the earliest copies of John that include this story is the earliest copy from John that includes this story is the 5th century. Got it? I've already told you about that. Draw that line in the sand. 5th century, that's the 400s. All those from 125 up until the beginning of the 400s do not include this story. Second, the first church father to mention that this story was in the text is not until the 10th century. Church father. These are preachers like uh, preachers who were disciples of John like Polycarp and Eusebius and uh, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and all them. Not until the 10th century do they even mention this story in their writings. Why? Because they know it's a false identification that's not supposed to be there. Now, how do we handle this? I'm going to tell you nice and simple. Don't use it. Just stay off of it. 
it got there because some preacher wrote it in, in the Greek, in his copy. This is his copy. He's out here preaching. He wrote this in as a note. He used it in his sermon. When his copy got old, he had a copy of it made. The, copy, the copyist who wrote it wrote all the letters looking exactly the same. Now, if you had his original copy, you'd see what the copyist's handwriting was, and then you'd see his handwriting. You'd go, hey, that's not the same handwriting. But the, copy, but the preacher who's preaching wants all his notes in his new copy. You follow me? Uh, we don't know where he got that one. We do not know. And it's the 400s before it ever shows up anywhere. So that means 300, uh, almost 250 something years have passed since Christ walked on the earth before that story landed in the book. Okay? And we have it, but you know what? And I've, we have it, our committees are being honest. They put it in brackets so that we know it's not in the oldest, most reliable copy. By the way, we are finding now two or three copies of some part of the New Testament, Old Testament every year. With all the, you know, we live in a time now where we can excavate basically year-round. We can go archaeological find year-round. And we are finding a page or two. We're opening up a pot, some urn. We're opening it up, and there will be a few pages of the Bible in there. Even with everything we're finding, I mean, we found a, a whole book just the back side of it where the the laces were was worn out we found this past last year uh there are no changes in it there are no differences in it it's all exact that's what's so amazing about god's word is even though we've got these 71 hiccups that we call i'd call them hiccups where the additions have had when we time the dating of the book where it fits because because we know what kind of paper or what kind of material it's written on because, remember, Chinese paper doesn't happen until a certain time. It doesn't come over to the, to the area of uh, Israel and all that until a certain time after the days of Jesus, in fact. So we know what material it's on and how they used it from the time, how they did the lacing, how they did the cutting. We just see the tooling on it. We know about when it fits in time. This, these new documents all fit in a certain time, and they all match that time. We have yet to find any that match the oldest and most reliable that have anything in them. And we're finding some of those too. In fact, we opened up another cave two years ago at the Qumran cave. They found another cave and opened it up, found more documents in there, but they matched everything they had. Everything we had is matched. Nothing new. But I will tell you this, in the Qumran, we have actually now have copies of the Old Testament that are 2,000 years older than we had 150 years ago. 2,000 years older, and they all match. And in fact, in the two Isaiah passages, if you've ever been to Israel, uh, in the museum that's got the Isaiah scroll there, there's two full copies of Isaiah. There is one, one character mistake in the whole book of Isaiah. Have y'all, any of y'all read the book of Isaiah? You've been through it with me, the whole thing. It took us... Well, we started studying the book of Isaiah when the Dead Sea was still sick. That's how long that study was, okay? And in all of that, there's one character, and it may have just been a smudge. You see what I'm saying? That's how amazing all of this is. All right, let's look on. Here we go. So now we come. At the end of the book of Mark, <clears throat> we find another thing, and this story has really caused some theological problems, and we have got to hurry here. In this story, and I'm going to I'm going to pass up the first part of it, of it, and I'm going to start with verse nine in chapter sixteen. Let me tell you what's happening in there. Mary Magdalene uh, has coming into this. She's already been to the she's already been to the cave. She's she's already talked to Peter, and to, she's gone to tell them and all of that stuff about the grave and about meeting Jesus. And it says in verse nine, now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared, appeared to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now remember, this is in brackets. You never find out any place else in the scripture, and this passage is not there, that nothing in this red is found anywhere else in the Bible, by the way. We cannot prove that Mary Magdalene he cast seven demons out of. It's just not there. And so um, uh, she went... Uh, and reported to those who had been with him while they were uh, mourning and weeping. And you go on through this passage and look down about verse 16, because our time is running short, but I'm going to get, 
get to it. It said, verse 15 said, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Basically, what he says at the Mount, uh, Mount of Olives before he's going to rise into the air. He said, He who believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Thank you, our, our Church of Christ now say because of that verse right there, you have to be baptized to be saved. But he who uh, disbelieves shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. They will drink any de deadly poison. It will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus has spoken to them, he w was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word of the, by the signs that followed. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. After that, Jesus himself sent out through them from, every, from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. So was Jesus already gone or was he still here? Here's the big deal. First evidence. You see that word Lord Jesus? Okay, first of all, the word now. In Mark's writing, every time he uses the word now, he's fixing to add something that pushes the story along, giving you information you've never heard before. Well, in this passage, it tends to tell us stuff because it backs up. It tends to back up to want to tell us some stuff he evidently uh, missed. Second of all, he mentions Mary in chapter 16, verse 9. He's introducing us to Mary Magdalene like he hadn't just got through talking to Mary Magdalene. He's just been dealing with Mary Magdalene, and he's introducing her like, for the, like she's the one who seven demons were cast out. Well, where'd that come from? Third, the context of 17 through 18, the picking of the serpents, the speaking in tongues, the casting out demons, the drinking poison. All of you know where that, those things go to. We got problems with that. We got problems with that because it's nowhere else. Nowhere else. Then, fourth, the vocabulary, Lord Jesus. Mark does not use the word Lord Jesus anywhere else in the book of Mark. This is the only place. He does not call Jesus Lord Jesus. We got a problem. This is the guy who was wearing the, the sheet that he got up and ran out of when they left the upper room, which was in his father and mother's house. On the side of the wall, of the, uh, on that uh, northwest side of Jerusalem. It's John Mark's house. And he's the one that's writing the story. He ought to know. He ought to know. First of all, in the rest of the time, I've given you some other examples here. For Mark, everything's astonishing to him. Everything's amazing. And it's so exciting. When you read Mark, it just pushes you through the book. It's just exciting. And all of a sudden, we hit this passage. It's like, da, 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 da. There's no excitement to it. External evidence. The earliest copy of Mark that includes this story is from the 4th century. <clears throat> that means that the oldest doesn't have it. Our church fathers, Eusebius, Justin Martyr, Tartan, uh, uh, Tartan uh, um, Arrhenius, all knew about this ending, and they dismissed it. That means these are our major church fathers. What we know about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, sin, salvation, angels, the church, um, the Bible, and last things. What we know about those doctrines, these are the guys who hammered it out for us. Yes, they're all Catholic. Yes, they're all good theologians. And they all knew about this Mark ending, and they all said it doesn't belong. In fact, Eusebius stated that it doesn't belong in the manuscript. Uh, your, your notes have a mistake there. It said, uh, Eusebius stated that the Greek manuscript did not contain this ending. You should have the word not in there. So how do you handle it? Just leave it, leave it, let it be. Let it go. Do not use it. So we've got theology problems. You, you see that picture up there handling snakes? Well, our holiness, our charismatic, our church of God, uh, some of those little pockets in different little areas, they still pick up theology of handling snakes from this passage of Scripture. So let's go through a few other things, and we need to be through here in about five minutes. For the remainder of this lesson, we're going to actually cover a buku of interpretation difficulties, okay? Buku of them. We're going to cover more in the next five minutes than we've covered before.
I've explained to you about added text and how it happened. I've explained to you about common sense. I've explained to you about uh, definitions of words. I've explained to you about figures of speech. But now I'm going to show you some problems that happen in, in our, uh, with our teachers. By the way, and I've already told you this, every teacher makes these mistakes. Just hold them to it. Make sure that what they're, if they're saying something and they make one of these interpretation difficulties, make sure that you, but what they're saying is correct and hold them to the fire. It may make them mad at you, but it's okay. And so for the purposes of this, uh, for the purpose of this, I have, have collected a little topical message that, by the way, is not my message. I uh, recorded when it was begun uh, off of one of our more charismatic television stations. And that's all I'm going to say about it. But these are not my words. This is what a preacher said. And I'm going to show you a, a false preacher, by the way. He's, he's doing this for the intent of leading you to a theology that is his theology and not God's. And so here we go. The preacher speaks. He says, good morning, everyone. Today, I want you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 11, verse 35. Is everyone there? Good. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word and read the text together. All together now. Jesus wept. And then he looks at the audience and to the camera. He says, thank you. I want you to be seated now. Today, I want, you, I want to talk to you about crying and depression. Depression is caused by 10 factors. On number one of your listening guide, I want you to write the words mental illness. Stop. Do you see it? Do you see any problems with that? You better see some problems with that. But you may not know that you need to see some problems with that. You need to see some problems with that. First of all, it's called topical messages. Anybody who's doing a topical message can decide what he wants to teach you and go find a phrase, a verse, or a passage anywhere and a whole bunch of them and cut phrases off and whatever and make it say anything he wants to teach. He can teach you out of the Word of God. He can teach you about goodness. He can teach you about badness. And he may teach the badness as goodness if he wants to. A la Jim Jones and the people's church, a la Charles Simpson, and the people who climbed up on their bunk beds and shot stuff in their veins because they were waiting for the ship out behind the moon to take them away. These preachers that started out as Christian preachers, by the way, and be it Mormon, be it Church of Christ, be it, be it whatever, be it good churches, be it bad churches, be it uh, any cult, they take and use the Bible. The favorite book of all cults and all religions is the Bible. They always use the Bible. And you can take out of the Bible and you can use about passage to prove anything you want to prove. And the second thing is, goes right here. It is called, the next problem, which is called biblical hooks. When you say, let's read our Bible, Jesus wept. Most of the time, an unlearned Bible teacher will say, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. It is the shortest English verse in the Bible by one word, but the shortest Greek verse in the Bible is found in Luke chapter 16, verse 20. That means, and by the way, Luke chapter 16, verse 20, that sentence is two words, and this sentence in the original, which we have two words, Jesus wept, is actually five words. So in other words, we can say this is the shortest verse in the English Bible, and it's a correct statement. Never mind that. My purpose is biblical hooks. Everybody loves the Bible, and everybody loves Jesus. All you got to do is just quote Jesus. All you got to do is just quote the Bible. And whatever comes out of that has to be true, because you quoted the Bible, right? You quoted Jesus, or you quoted the Bible. Jesus wept. And then the guy has the gall to say, let's talk about mental depression. Jesus was weeping because he was depressed and had mental depression. Is that what in that passage? He's talking about Lazarus. He's fixing to raise him from the dead. Do you think he's talking, he's, he's mentally insane? Well, some of our comedians this past week probably would say Jesus was mentally insane. If you know where I'm headed there. Preacher goes on to say this. Preacher speaks. Message goes on. Good morning. Oh, I've already done that one. Preacher goes on. 
You cannot get past your depression caused by mental illness unless you help yourselves. The Bible teaches us God helps those who helps themselves. I couldn't have written this. So what's going so he's made a citation, and that's where we are. Number eight, stop, look at this. Number eight, saying without citing. The Bible tells us this, the Bible tells us that, the Bible tells us this, the Bible tells us that. Okay, tell me where it says that. Now, wait a moment, we're not through yet because this gets really good because there's going to be some citing even with sources that's going to be right off the wall. So here we go. He's coming, just a problem. If somebody says the Bible says this, make sure... The Bible says that. Go read it. Next, the preacher speaks. Crying is your problem. We don't even know where this guy's coming from because he's fixing a flip-flop on us. Cry, cry, cry. Someone has told you not to cry, but you must cry. But get over your crying as soon as possible so you can get healthy. God knows about you. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 23, speaks about when you, uh, speaks to you and about you when it says, there's a voice crying in the wilderness, and you're that voice crying in that wilderness. I like the laugh, because you got it, didn't you? Who is crying in the wilderness talking about? John the Baptist proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. It doesn't mean he's out there going, boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo -hoo. And Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 15 says, why cry over your thoughts? Jeremiah 33 11 speaks, it says, the cry of joy and there's a cry of gladness. Crying is important to God and to all of us. But at some point, it's not healthy for your mental illness. This person is stuck on mental illness. Evidently thought Jesus was mentally ill. Stop, stop, stop. First of all, there's over-specification. Anytime you hear a preacher talk about cry, 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 cry. In fact, we've got one that's alive still today that's on regular on religious TV. says, the, 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 this, and the, that, and the, 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 the. And it's another one. And, he, and another one he uses is A. A means A. The means the. When it says the, it means the. It's the, them, this, that, the, this, a. Hey. Anybody who focuses on an unimportant word like that, that is called overspecification. They're trying to present something to you to make it a fact for you for a theology that fits what they're teaching and not what God is thinking. Next thing we stop again, okay? That should be a big red flag. Selective citing. We got them here. We got John 1, 23, selective. We got Jeremiah 30, 15. We got Jeremiah 33, 1. In selective citing, that means they're trying to prove something by going over and grabbing a bunch of verses. And if you read all those verses in context, you go, well, that's not what he's talking about. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's about John the Baptist proclaiming that Jesus come. Next thing that happens, uh, the problem we've already got is twisted translation. Twisted translation. This is the one that crying, he, he's, he's, he's coming up here and, and he's, he's saying this verse. The verse has absolutely nothing to do with crying or because of depression. And yet false teachers will try to link all these verses together to get you to, to go with what they're teaching. Inaccurate quotations. Had you been following along and actually looked up those verses, which I looked up, Jeremiah 30, 15, he quoted as, why cry over your thoughts? But the Jeremiah passage actually says, why cry over your wounds? There's a whole bunch of difference between those two, wouldn't you say? Big difference. All right. Those are 12 things your ears should perk up when you hear things like this. 12 things we've studied. 12 interpretation difficulties. But the last one, the last one, is not an interpretation difficulty that I want to present to you. It is a major red flag of heresy if this happens. The preacher goes on to speak and says, Now, let us look at what God has told us in our, and pick one, our Book of Mormon, or they say our Christian Science Monitor, or they say our Watchtower Magazine, or any other book. Once they start trying to talk to you about God's Word found in another book, understand 
you are in the presence of someone who is intentionally using all these 12 interpretation difficulties to lead you astray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you and keep us from falling under the influence of false teachers that come our way. In your name, amen and amen.